Mr. Nels. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, you have 66 billion, 66 with a B, for rail and IIJA. That's a lot of money at your department's discretion. The California High Speed Rail Project started 15 years ago. Big, big promises in that project. It was supposed to be the, the next best thing in transportation in America. And for the record, I just want to let you know and everybody know that I support high speed rail in America. I just don't support this project. And here's why. I have a document here. It's the California High Speed Rail Peer Review Group letter from March 23rd, 2023. And I'd like to submit it for the record. Are, are you familiar with this, this document, sir? Uh, I can't recognize That's okay. it. Okay, I'll make sure you I'm get. I'm aware one. that there's been Fair a lot enough. of reporting. Yeah. This document is nothing more than it's an SOS warning to cancel the California High Speed Rail project because it's riddled with billions in cost overruns. The numbers in this document almost make it seem criminal. And I'm going to quote directly from the letter written to the board members. This group was created by Proposition 1A and is required to report to the state legislature in California on the California High Speed Rail Authority. In this document, the peer review group says, since 2008, a consistent theme emerges. Project costs, schedules, and ridership estimates are uncertain and subject to significant risk of deteriorating. The project is underfunded and its financing is unstable, raising, rising costs and making effective management difficult, if not impossible. Most importantly, more legislative oversight is needed. In the peer review 2023 project update report, it states that project costs continue to rise with no clear end in sight. The current contract values are 97%, Mr. Secretary, higher than the original award values. Phase one grew from 68 billion in 2012 to 92 billion in 2022, and now projected to be $106 billion in 2023. The scheduling on the costs, it says const a construction project was awarded in August of 2013, and it was to be completed in 2018. This is before COVID, don't use COVID as an excuse. And now they say the current completion is December of 2026. Ridership. Big idea, 2009, big business plan, 41 million people. Now you know what they project for 2023, down to 31 million people. Why do they have 110 million less? I don't know. But the report, and, and you need to get this, sir, because you need to see it. The report recommends that the legislature may want to request the selection and appointment of the inspector general be given high priority. This project needs to be looked at. This is billions of dollars of taxpayers' money. It's my understanding now they want $3 billion more from the federal city inner city passenger grant program. And I want to make sure, sir, that we're not throwing good money after bad. The letter highlights that even if the project gets $8 billion, they will still be short of at least another $2.5 billion, even after the state of California funds are included. Have you visited the project, sir? Uh, I haven't been to the construction. Oh, you got to get there. You got to get there, sir. This is billions and billions of dollars. Are you willing to invest more taxpayer dollars on this project, which seems highly unlikely to succeed, versus sending that limited money elsewhere? Well, I want to take care. Let me start with where we agree, which is uh, uh, support for high-speed rail in general, and supporting high-speed rail in general doesn't you. necessarily mean uh, that that uh, one would support a particular project. Because this particular project is in active application for some processes yeah. that are underway, I want to be careful not to prejudice that I process. Uh, what and, I will... and, and, and listen, I appreciate you, sir, and I think this is what we should do. I think we should work together, you and I, conduct a full audit of the project before any high-speed grant decisions are made. Maybe you can call me up one day, we get on that jet, and we go fly out there and take a good look at it. How's that? <laughs> you want to go look at that? Because I'm telling you, this gives high-speed rail a bad look. It's just costing billions of dollars and they're going to come to your office and they're going to request more. I got to move into something else because I have 29 seconds. Mm. Do we have a pilot shortage, my friend? Uh, pilot availability is certainly... We do have a pilot shortage. I fly around a lot of time. Cancel, cancel, cancel. Do you believe that at a certain age that people should be forced to retire? This, this arbitrary age of 65, you think that's fair, that's right? Yes. You do. How about having people in the highest office in our nation over 80? 
I think most of us can agree. I'm just that asking you a question. Certain professions you, like flying and aircraft are different. Should we be forced to retire as a president and, uh, of the United States at 80? You know, I think there are a lot of folks here who could do a great job regardless yeah. of their age. But let's I wouldn't keep our experienced pilots in the air, sir. Let's keep them in the air. With that, I yield back. Let's see. Who's next? Carson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's a tough performance to follow. Mr. Secretary, uh, it is a pleasure uh, to welcome you back, sir, uh, to TNI. First, I want to thank you for traveling back to your home state, the great Hoosier State and the city of Indianapolis last month to examine some of our transformational investments in our bipartisan infrastructure law, and that includes the $25 million raise grant to make our downtown streets safer. Uh, you and I, sir, spent some time at the Sheet Metal Workers Local Apprenticeship and Training Program to learn firsthand how a uh, new generation of tradesmen and women are learning their crafts. Mr. Secretary, what is the department doing to expand these kinds of programs, sir? And how are you working to strengthen the transportation workforce with diverse participants, including minorities, disadvantaged, or underemployed, underemployed individuals and returning citizens? And how can this committee help expand the department's work? Well, thanks, Congressman, for the question. Thanks for a great visit uh, to uh, the Indianapolis area. I was really uh, uh, moved by what I saw in ter terms of the work that is going on to prepare those workers of the future for all of those jobs uh, that are now materializing. And it's, it's an extraordinary thing to have gone from not that many years ago wondering where all the work was going to be to now being more concerned about where the workers are going to come from. Uh, but that's certainly uh, where we are right now. And we are actively working through a number of funding streams and, and programmatic authorities at the Department of Transportation to do our part to help with the workforce issue. I'll offer just one example that's included in the IIJA that I think is instructive, uh, which is that uh, there is a requirement in uh, the uh, programming that we use to acquire low and no emission buses for transit agencies that at least 5% of that funding be put toward a workforce program, whether it's in partnership with a labor union, a community college, or another entity, uh, in order to make sure that those workers who are qualified to uh, repair and maintain diesel buses are ready to work on those low and no emission buses. That's just one example, but another thing we're doing is urging project sponsors like state DOTs uh, to recognize the availability of formula dollars, uh, often for workforce purposes. And I know that you have been a leading voice uh, in advocating for attention to those excluded and minority workers who have not historically had as much of a role in the building trades, uh, but are, of course, uh, as capable as anybody of delivering that next generation of transportation infrastructure. Uh, we've uh, enjoyed working with a number of entities from transit agencies uh, to, uh, to labor union locals that have been taking steps forward to include people who may not have that multi-generational background in the building trades, uh, but uh, can get on those ladders to the middle class and bring good incomes to their families through those good paying jobs. Sir, and lastly, Mr. Secretary, how can disadvantaged communities uh, get better connected and plugged into EV infrastructure? Indiana was awarded $100 million, uh, but the capital city only received $15 million. And I'm going to offer a, 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 a record, uh, for the record, an op-ed from our state NAACP describing our concerns uh, for your review. And I understand, sir, there are some discretionary funds available to help fill those gaps. Uh, can you give us an update on how those gaps are being filled, sir? Yes, thank you. This is one of the uh, primary purposes for the community uh, infrastructure element of the electric vehicle charging uh, funds that were included in the IIJA. And in addition to those formula dollars, uh, which, by the way, are subject to uh, Title VI and other requirements that the states follow through on their civil rights obligations, uh, we also have these discretionary dollars that we can use to plug those gaps. Often it is disadvantaged communities who could, in theory, benefit from the, the most from the fuel savings that come with an EV, but only if two other things are true. One, that they can afford access to the EV in the first place, which is one of the reasons why those tax credits and, and uh, uh, moves in the IRA to cut the sticker price are so important. And two, that they have access to chargers, including in places where it might not yet be profitable for corporations to install them. Uh, that's where we believe policy can make a difference, and that's where we're going to be targeting many of these funds. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I yield back, I yield back Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Secretary, thank you for coming. Thanks for uh, listening to our questions. I want to pick up where we left off in July of 2022 regarding what I view as the administration's anti-market policies in regard to EVs. They are expensive. 
the grid is not, we're building a second grid, I guess, on top of the grid we already have, which is a huge cost and people are paying for that in their electric bills. The batteries have limited range and despite the subsidization, the market is literally not adopting EVs, regardless of what we want to believe or what you want to say. There's significant inflationary pressures and a glut of electric vehicles, well beyond demand. And so in, if we consider the current UAW strike, the cost of living has eaten away at these folks' ability to pay their grocery bill and their gas bill. So they're obviously and righteously and rightfully upset. Uh, and the administration's subsidization of the electric vehicles has, is killing their jobs. They know this. On the second point related to EVs, I think it's important to quote the UAW president, Sean Fain, directly, and I quote, not only is the federal government not using its power to turn the tide, they're actively funding a race to the bottom with billions in public money, unquote. Now, you've recently moved to Michigan, I understand it, and I just wonder what you have to say to Michiganders who feel the federal government is using their very tax dollars to destroy their industry and their jobs? Well, one of two things is going to happen, Representative. Uh, either the EV revolution is going to be made in China or it's going to be made in America. So but right now it's destroying their jobs. Is that we are working to make sure that it's made in and America. And it's being subsidized, which is destroying their jobs. So is your, is your position that we're going to lose all these jobs, that, that's, that's what has to happen or, or China's gonna build all these vehicles. Is that the position? One of the reasons we've seen manufacturing jobs grow so much in this administration compared to the manufacturing recession under the last administration is that we're investing in American manufacturing. You're investing with companies. our money in things that we don't want. You realize that forcing car companies to make these vehicles at a loss, about $60,000 per vehicle sold is damaging to the UAW's jobs. In fact, I'm gonna just look at Ford. I hate to call them out, but their electric vehicle unit is expected to lose $4.5 billion this year, which is up from $2.1 billion in losses last year. There's a 92-day supply of electric vehicles, which is twice that of the current average of the internal combustion or traditional in, uh, car. And I would just remind everybody that electric vehicles were one of the first vehicles on the market back in the early 1900s, but they were, they were replaced by better technology, by better technology then. Now, the average new vehicle transaction price is about, I don't know, I just heard one of my colleagues, 50,000. I've got 48,763, which is up $10,000 since your boss became the president. And the average used vehicle price is $26,510. Mr. Secretary, the people I work for, my bosses can't afford what you're forcing on them. These are not market forces. This is the government funding the destruction of our own automotive industry. And I hope you know that approximately two thirds of EV owners make over $100,000 a year. My bosses don't make that. I don't know if you can justify or how you justify forcing my constituents to pay for EVs and EV infrastructure for coastal elites and wealthy people, but somehow you do. Well, I need to point out that wealthy people were specifically excluded from the Inflation Reduction Act. Well, we I just we gave you the number. I, do you dispute that two-thirds of EV owners are owned by people over 100, 000, that make over 100,000? Sure, because the, yeah, the first EVs, of course, were Do you dispute that? Uh, I no, mean, but that number's the, going down. Those are the facts. It doesn't matter if they're going down now. Then My why were the you folks that I represent can't afford them today, sir. Why were you against cutting their costs? All these factors... I'm not against cutting their costs, the market should do it, but you want the, the government, you want my taxpayers to pay to cut the cost, which isn't cutting the if cost, you were of it's the view, subsidizing the cost. Congressman, Sir, if you were with of the all view these that there should be no combined, subsidy to propulsion all these vehicles factors that are you combined, against oil and gas subsidies, mean that, mean that for every that oil EV sold, sir, at a loss, that the cost of the, as my, as my colleague on the other side, the gas guzzling pickup truck is higher now to pay for the loss as you kill your administration and you in particular kill the auto industry. And I'll remind you, in 2008, after a financial crisis, the federal government bailed out this industry. So while you're here today, will you commit and will you pledge to oppose any effort to bail out the auto industry after you force it into bankruptcy again? Will you do that today, sir? Congressman, I got started in politics 
when I guess the answer is no. I yield the factory. Was at risk of being shut down because an elected official in my state tried to block the administration from saving Chrysler. I got involved and stood with the UAW to save those jobs, and I'll always be with auto jobs being preserved.